Tuomet labas vakaras ekliai, labas rytas klausytojams. Šiandien na, prie mūsų prisijungia iš beveik kitos planetos pusės iš Kalifornijos eklė. Čia Kanavičiūtė, kuri šiuo metu dirba NASA'oje, prieš tai studijavo irgi ne vienerius metus valstijose, tiek teko matyti, tiek prestižinės universitetuose Harvard'e ir Stanford'e. Tai tikrai malonu iš sužinoti dabar, ką eglė į mums papasakos, kokias tau vienas iš na, tyrimų, kurie susiję su kosminiais apie atsparumą radiacijai. Čia mums kai kuriems irgi šiek tiek giminingą temą, bent iš toli, tai tuomet paprašysiu... Excuse me, excuse me, may we talk in English? Sure. Should I repeat the presentation in English? Or... I think it would be great just okay. it's international conference, so All right. let's, let's try it. <laughs> so, good evening to Agda and good morning to our listeners. Uh, we are happy to have Agda here from all the way from the other side of the globe, well, almost from California, in particular, for, um, well, right now, probably from home, but in general, working at NASA. And before that, she was, um, well, uh, studied in prestigious universities like Harvard and Stanford. And uh, today, it's our great pleasure to have her uh, to, well, tell us about her latest research in well, spatial devices, or in particular, uh, radiation damage, uh, which is also a dear topic to some of us. And I would be glad to give a floor to Agla. And um, let's, uh, well, give her virtual applause. I, I can do that on my end here. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much for this lovely introduction and for a wonderful opportunity to tell you about space biology. So as always, sharing the screen. Somebody tell me that it works. Yes. yes? <laughs> okay, great. So I am Agli Chakanovichute. I am a scientist at NASA Ames Research Center in the Radiation Biophysics Lab, where I am one of the principal investigators. And our research in the lab is focused on the neuroimmune impact of spaceflight and especially deep space radiation. So since I assume not many of you are space biologists, I will give you a brief introduction to the field and then tell you about our main projects. And this is the uh, required disclaimer that everything I say is my own opinion and not that of the US government. So why should we care about studying the central nervous system and immune responses in the context of space flight? Because we are going back to the moon on the Artemis mission, and that will include both a lunar surface and a space station in lunar orbit called Gateway. And then we will proceed onwards to Mars. Now, what people commonly don't realize is how far that is. If the International Space Station, with all our astronauts right now, is 250 miles above our heads, then the moon is 250,000 miles. And Mars, at its farthest point, more than 250 million miles. So the missions will be long, up to three years, and the resources will be limited, and the effects on health will be quite high. So the main spaceflight hazards that we need to consider in general are space radiation, which is something I will tell you about in much more detail later, also changes in gravity. So microgravity near zero G in flight but also partial gravity on the moon and on Mars and a hypergravity, 3G, and in extreme cases, up to 6G during launch and landing. Other issues that could cause um, damage to health are confinement, so 
social and physical distancing, which all of us are extremely aware of right now. Uh, distance from Earth, which means a delay in communications, and also um, no chance to bring a sick crew member back down or get a resupply mission quickly if you're all the way on Mars. And also what we call hostile and closed environment, which is um, kind of a common term for a lot of other stressors, such as uh, noise, high carbon dioxide, disrupted circadian rhythms, um, and so on. Now, for our purposes, in terms of the health impacts, uh, based on studies on astronauts, we know that they cause morphological changes in the brain that are visible in MRI. They also cause what's called spaceflight associated neuroocular syndrome, which is uh, vision changes. And uh, they are associated with uh, edema or swelling of the optic disc. Also immune dysfunction, especially a, a reduced um, resistance to pathogenic microbes and cardiovascular deficits with the emphasis on vascular because it becomes important in the rest of the body um, that has vasculature, including the brain. And there is a, a recent review that I would highly recommend, a part, um, a partially written by our team um, on uh, all the hazards of space exploration together. So what specifically happens in space like to the central nervous system and how do we study that? And just as an introduction, I'll tell you about the experiment that just landed in January. And I mean, what I mean by that is that we have sent rodents to space, both young and middle age, because most of the astronauts are middle age. And we study them not only what happens to them in flight, but also what happens to them when they come back down to Earth. With the idea that after enough time in microgravity, going back to 1G can be a major stressor to the whole body. And also, uh, spaceflight may um, combine with other processes, such as natural aging, and exacerbate them, basically make it worse. So we flew these mice in this kind of containment to the space station over multiple missions. The last one is just, just, just came down and currently I'm actually at NASA processing samples from it. And we have um, performed multiple um, uh, different uh, studies on gene expression, including gene expression based on different areas in the brain, as well as a single cell level in the brain and in the immune system. Now, mouse brain studies in space flight can be counted basically on one hand. And this is the largest and the highest resolution such study. And now, instead of um, telling you what we found out, I would like you um, to invite you actually to check it out for yourselves because Gene Lab is an open access database of all spaceflight omics data. And we have just uh, put up the spatial transcriptomics data on it from the Rodent Research 3 mission. And just as much as we can study it and come up with our conclusions, you too can study all different spaceflight data, this and others, and come up with your conclusions as scientists. Okay, but these mice really took a trip to their neighborhood. What I am much more interested in is um, um, astronaut future missions um, to the moon and to Mars. And there they will be exposed to the kind of radiation that nobody is exposed on Earth because we are protected by the magnetic field of the Earth and the International Space Station, for the most part, is as well. So that kind of radiation, deep space radiation, that we are the most worried about, is transmitted by the galactic cosmic rays, which is basically a shower of particles, most likely formed um, in supernovas. There are protons, helium ions, and if you imagine a periodic table, all the particles all the way through iron. 
these are the most biologically effective and um, um, cause the most harm to health. Because if you can imagine, they pierce the cells, they pierce the nuclei, break apart DNA, that if it is not healed properly, can introduce mutations and predispose somebody to cancer. And also cause major oxidative stress, which leads to cell death, which leads to inflammatory responses and other health effects. Now, if we want to study it, we currently cannot send our experiments to the moon. So we bring radiation to Earth instead. We simulated at a NASA Space Radiation Lab, uh, which is part of Brookhaven National Lab, the only um, place to, study, to, to simulate deep space radiation in the US. And we use uh, particle accelerators here. Um, that's me in the beamline. Uh, Star Trek outfit is optional. And that is me looking straight at the beamline, specifically at our proton source. So those are probably the favorite experiments for the whole lab. Now, specifically, we are interested in the central nervous system responses to space radiation. And we further want to model human central nervous system responses. Why so? Well, what do we know so far about how central nervous system or CNS responds to this simulated deep space radiation? Remember, we simulated in particle accelerators. The vast majority of our um, knowledge comes from experiments done on rodents, which show cell damage in the brain, both neuronal cell damage and the accessory cell, glial cell damage, which are cells other than neurons in the brain, increased inflammation, and on the behavioral side, um, cognitive deficits and memory deficits. However, Radiation does not affect just the brain, it affects the whole body. And in the rest of the body, it causes immune dysfunction. So one of our um, points of interest was, okay, well, the body interacts with the brain through the blood-brain barrier. What happens to the blood-brain barrier when it is irradiated? The answer is nobody knows. In addition, we wanted to study it in humans um, in part because it is higher applicability, making human models to obviously uh, developing um, countermeasures, which is a space term for therapeutics to uh, mitigate the health risk of radiation in space. And in part because developing organ and tissue models um, makes it easier to fly experiments, especially on the longer missions than um, having to do experiments in rodents. Um, and of course, we want to start understanding what could be the potential mechanisms that underlie radiation effects so that they could later be targeted for treatments. Okay, so I am sure not everyone in the audience is a neuroscientist, so a very rough idea of what is the blood-brain barrier. Um, it's a tube, which is a blood vessel. The outside of the tube is, is endothelial cells. Inside we have the blood, which contains immune cells, which contains cytokines, other messenger molecules. On the brain side, there are parasites, which are most structural cells, and very importantly, astrocytes, which not only regulate the opening of blood-brain barrier, but also affect um, neurons, control neuroinflammation, generally regulate neuronal health. So we want to, to model blood-brain barrier, human, ideally high throughput, and definitely on something that is 3D. Uh, for that, we have teamed up with a company uh, to um, uh, utilize a commercially available chip model to basically build chips where we loaded different types of cells and our endothelial cells formed tubes that simulate a blood vessel and then we seeded the rest of the chip with neurons and astrocytes or astrocytes alone for most of the proof of concept experiments. All of these are primary cells and uh, um, they nicely form 3D structures and are high throughput. Again, for the first time, um, 
of using them for space radiation specifically experiments. Here's one of our chips with a nice tube of um, um, endothelial cells. There are some other images. Everything in green here is astrocytes. Everything in red here is uh, different um, um, images of um, uh, endothelial cells. Now, what can we do in terms of quantifying responses to radiation? So one of the main issues with a blood-brain barrier is that, well, normally it's supposed to be closed and not leaky. If it's leaky, it generally causes more damage because then if the rest of the body is damaged and for example is undergoing inflammation, then it's going to bring that in those inflammatory responses to the brain, very roughly speaking, and exacerbate the damage to the brain. Okay, can we quantify how blood-brain barrier is leaky in our model? We can do so by loading a dye into the blood vessel and quantifying its leakiness in the neighboring channel. The leakier the barrier, the more fluorescent dye will be in the neighboring channel. And in graphs that I will soon show you, the closer to one will be the ratio of the dye in the neighboring channel to the dye in the loaded channel. And uh, we can obviously quantify other aspects such as cellular damage and oxidative stress and cytokine production and uh, um, other outcomes. So after building this chip, and all of this research, by the way, is mostly like about a year old, of which a great deal was spent in, a, um, in isolation at home because of COVID, um, we started with uh, looking at a more just conceptual idea of, OK, let's irradiate with the right dose of radiation, but slightly different kind before particle radiators, radiating with x-rays. What happens to the permeability? And this is a sample image of um, many such studies where we used endothelial cells and um, um, specific fluorescent dye of a specific size is a smaller size dye. And then we quantified increase in the relative fluorescence. Remember, the closer to one, the more leaky the barrier at different time points after irradiation from four hours to one week. Blue um, lines are unirradiated, red lines are irradiated. Well, basically, the blood vessels, when irradiated, become leaky. And the leakiness begins at about 24 hours and continues for about a week. Um, to quantify this, we can measure our area under the curve and then compare different types of endothelial cells, because we don't want to find a phenomenon that only works, works with one specific type of human endothelial cells. It's always nice to try multiple. Um, also different um, uh, sizes of dye to sort of quantify how big the holes are in the barrier. Uh, the general gist of it is the same. It starts getting leaky at 24 hours. It continues being leaky um, for at least a week. And these effects are um, associated with an um, increase in oxidative stress. And uh, basically, just aging the system um, increases oxidative stress already, and irradiation does it even more. So this is um, all very promising. But of course, we mostly want to find out what happens um, in response to simulated deep space radiation. And for that, uh, we selected uh, iron particles. They are part of the most biologically active component of galactic cosmic rays, these high mass and charged particles. If you can imagine, they are very large, they're very energetic, they cause a great deal of harm to cells. And they are particularly important to study in terms of potential effects to health. So uh, we use this iron particle irradiation. At first, we looked at okay, what does it have? What what does it do to endothelial cells? As far as we can tell, absolutely nothing. The cells are very healthy all the way until the particles are 0.82 grays, which is already more um, in terms of. Um, um, perceived dose what, um, um, what we expect for um, uh, a three-year Mars mission. These are two different types of endothelial cells. However, when we irradiated astrocytes, 
we saw something completely different. As you can see, even if you have not seen astrocytes before, well, they are gone. And they are increasingly gone and look increasingly unhappy the more um, irradi we irradiate them. So we observed cellular damage, cell death, and oxidative stress in astrocytes um, in response to radiation. That means they're sensitive. They're the cell type in the brain that are particularly sensitive to deep space radiation. Okay, well, do these barriers still get leaky? And what do astrocytes do to the leakiness of the blood-brain barrier? For that, we cultured um, endothelial cells with and without astrocytes, irradiated them, and quantify leakiness. Here you see um, our results after only one type of endothelial cells and one type of fluorescent uh, marker, but we have done multiple. Basically, this is a very representative one. At different time points, 24 hours and 72 hours here. The open bars are no astrocytes, closed bars are with astrocytes, uh, blue is unirradiated, increasing shades of red is irradiated. The general idea is that irradiation opens the blood-brain barrier, but only when astrocytes are present. Reliably, multiple experiments, um, astrocytes seem to be a sensitizer to irradiation in terms of uh, breaking apart blood-brain barrier, which again is associated with harm to health. Um, the same thing happens with oxidative stress. Irradiation in general increases oxidative stress, especially when astrocytes are present. So in this case, astrocytes sort of exacerbate the issue, again, probably by being the sensitive cell type in the system. And I want to spare you a million graphs showing change, different changes in important inflammatory molecules, but I do want to note one of them which is something called interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, or IL-1-RA. Um, it is reduced by radiation in astrocytes alone. It is reduced by radiation and astrocytes in our system. It's blue um, bars are no radiation. Um, red bars are with the radiation. This is endothelial cells alone. This is endothelial cells in astrocytes. And it is associated with an increase of a number of markers, including interleukin-1 itself, but also uh, others that in turn all have the capacity to open the blood-brain barrier. So this is our hypothetical mechanism. And I say specifically hypothetical because we need to go to Brookhaven and irradiate them again and check whether this is the correct mechanism through which astrocytes open the blood-brain barrier and a way to um, target it to, um, um, to reduce this particular type of damage. Now, we're particularly interested in targeting it because we could just increase the IL-1 receptor antagonist, right? It would seem that this would go up, then IL-1A would go down, and hopefully blood-brain barrier would close. And that's particularly nice because you, uh, the IL-1 receptor antagonist is, um, is an approved uh, therapeutic, is an approved drug for use in autoimmune diseases. So it's always nice when you don't have to invent new medications and you can use ones that are already used for something else. So in summary for this part, we have developed this human 3D uh, multicellular system to uh, study the neurovascular effects of space radiation. And our first studies using iron particles have shown that it makes blood vessels leaky that it causes oxidative stress, that these effects are likely mediated by astrocytes, which seem to be the weakest link, which is really important. It's really nice to know what could be the weakest link because this is the targetable type of cell. And also it's suggesting, not proving yet, but suggesting an idea that we could try to um, 
increase IL-1 or 8 to uh, counteract its inhibition that seems to happen during radiation to try to close the blood-brain barrier and this way um, reduce the damage to health. What are we going to do next with this part? Well, in general, this chip is quite high throughput, so we want to use it to um, um, validate experimentally um, an ongoing study that we only had uh, one publication so far, and we're working on it pretty hard, which is um, focused on um, repurposing drugs from various terrestrial diseases for use in spaceflight. And for that, we are um, comparing computationally different um, um, chemical compositions, changes in gene expression, um, other outcomes of spaceflight with the known outcomes in terrestrial diseases, and then say, aha, spaceflight overlaps with this part of diseases. They are cured by those drugs. That means these may be applicable to flight too. But of course, we'll need to um, um, check them experimentally. Another um, field of study would be checking um, the um, neurovascular responses to uh, space radiation for a particular person in a personalized manner. So basically, if I want to go to Mars, and I do want to go to Mars, I would quite like to know how my cells respond to uh, space radiation and uh, respond to various treatments. For that, cells can be derived into induced pluripotent stem cells, which can then be turned into endothelial cells or astrocytes, because that's the kind of cells that we already were using. We were just not um, matching it to a particular person. And then um, um, they can be studied in terms of you can build a 3D system and study how it reacts. And of course, the big dream of mine, same as for any space biologist, is, well, I want to fly them. And uh, they have the advantage of being fairly small footprint compared to, say, an entire set of mice. So um, that's something I would love to get to work on. Now, I would also like to tell you a little bit about another project in the lab. So I mentioned about how I would be very interested in um, uh, using um, my neurovascular system to uh, study personalized responses to space radiation. So why is that important? Because if we all respond exactly the same way, well, then that's not a particularly interesting question. So to address that, um, the very, the, variability in human responses to deep space radiation. We have been um, um, study, we have had a, another very large ongoing study in our lab, which is really um, based on collecting immune cells from over 700 healthy donors, exposing those cells, to different particles that are main, major components of galactic cosmic rays, as well as gamma rays at different doses, at different time points. You can imagine this is a massive experiment. And we studied cell death, oxidative stress, and DNA damage using a marker for DNA repair. And also various secreted markers, including exosomes, which are extracellular vesicles. And in addition to it, we have genotyped them. Uh, we have performed whole genome sequencing with the idea of identifying which genes, well, which alleles of which genes are associated with increased or reduced uh, sensitivity to radiation. And also, um, the, uh, the um, sequencing together with studying exosomes may help us identify biomarkers of response severity. Now, all of these genomic associations will never be used to, to screening people. Instead, um, think about it. If you know the genes that are associated with radiation sensitivity, then you know what proteins they make, which mechanisms in the cell or in the, in the tissue these proteins are involved with, and those mechanisms and those proteins then can be targeted 
to reduce the uh, damage caused by radiation. To sort of bring back your resistant, your sensitive people to the level of resistant people, which is already very helpful to health. And um, so far, what have we found out? Um, well, in general, human variability is huge. There is a dose response to radiation. This is just showing a um, DNA damage radiation use foci per nucleus after different types and doses of the radiation. But as you see, the variability is enormous because some people respond to lower doses very little damage. And then as the dose increase, the damage increases. But other people respond with a great deal of damage, even to low doses of radiation. And this is just part of the whole big picture, because remember, we're studying oxidative stress and other um, aspects of it. And uh, this is a very interesting kind of ongoing big study um, near completion in terms of collecting data, but uh, now analysis is going full force. And there are two uh, recent papers from uh, our team, one identifying baseline DNA damage as a good marker of how much damage will be caused by radiation. And the other one, looking at microRNAs, which are small non-coding regulatory RNAs um, in both um, released by immune cell, by human immune cells, and also by um, various animal models and both uh, space flown and uh, irradiated to identify sort of microRNA signature that could also be a biomarker of radiation. And of course, in addition to this human study, we have a um, corresponding mouse study where we used uh, uh, various strains of mice. It is a much smaller one. And uh, also irradiated with different doses and types of radiation and studied here, focus on DNA repair. It's almost like a proof of concept because before we went into a human study. And uh, again, we genotyped them and found um, um, associations with quite a few interesting, um, uh, this is single nuclear poly polymorphism inside a few interesting genes. One of them is associated with a functional change in um, uh, complement 5A receptor, which is um, part of the immune system. So again, showing that uh, there are some interesting genomic associations with responses to radiation, the sensitivity or resistance to radiation that are um, linked to um, um, specific proteins in the immune system. And we are uh, working on uh, studying that in more detail as well, because this could be a good target um, for countermeasures. Okay, so uh, in the summary, we have been studying deep space radiation and other spaceflight stressors. And uh, we are interested in uh, neurovascular damage and neuroinflammatory responses in the brain, as well as the systemic responses. And that is where our studies on the immune system uh, become important, because in addition to uh, other aspects, they do indicate uh, various peripheral blood biomarkers, such as exosomes, such as microRNAs, that could be associated with response severity. In addition to a potential target in the innate immune system, complement protein in that case, that again could be a could be targeted by countermeasures to um, uh, reduce um, radiation-mediated damage or to increase resilience, to increase resistance. And of course, since radiation happens in the whole body, including the brain, the interaction between them happens through the blood-brain barrier. So that is what we are studying too. For that, we are building the organ on a chip system with a neurovascular component and um, observing that irradiation causes blood-brain barrier leakiness and um, um, it is, seems to be strongly mediated specifically by um, cells called astrocytes. And that's why these cells become important in terms of targeting them for uh, a radio protection. 
we are specifically interested in testing IL-1 receptor antagonists as a potential countermeasure in future studies. Um, at this level, we are, of course, interested in mechanisms and changes in gene expression. So that's um, some of it is all we are already working on in spaceflight studies, and that's what I invited you to look at at Gene Lab. And others, we are, um, you know, will be you basically be able to see in uh, various ongoing studies that will come out of our lab. And another important aspect is, of course, studying individual variability. As you see, the variability between a uh, um, cells from different donors in their sensitivity to radiation is very high, which is actually great. If everyone responded equally, it would be much harder to study and we would not have this wonderful possibility to um, push the sensitive people to the level of resistant people by um, some application of countermeasures. And that is the obviously the most important part, which is, well, we need to understand what happens in deep space, but we also need to understand how to mitigate it if it's bad. So um, um, at this point, um, I know that when I was a, a fairly junior scientist and uh, um, especially student, and I would listen to presentations and conferences, I would always want to ask, well, what is your favorite part of your work? Why do you do what you do? Like, what basically makes you go to work um, every day? So this is what we do. And why I do it is uh, because I personally believe that human space exploration is the most exciting and the most difficult endeavor that exists right now. And I want to help us get to Mars and back safe and healthy. And that's something I probably will not be able to live to see human exploration of Mars going full force. But even so, it is extremely rewarding to think about the fact that my work may help to get us there in a tiny, tiny bit. Because every little bit of understanding what happens to our bodies in space helps including what damage will be caused by space radiation to the brains and to the neurovascular system and what we can do to reduce it. And also it may help science on Earth because spaceflight stressors, when you look at them, the effect, um, especially the brain, in a somewhat similar way to neurodegenerative diseases and to normal aging. So discoveries that we make in space may be translatable to Earth as well. And I, on this note, I would like to thank um, my whole lab, especially Sylvain Costas, who is the other principal investigator in this collaborative lab, as well as our main collaborators in the um, uh, University of Bologna, everyone in Brookhaven National Lab. Um, th this is a part of my lab on various parts of the beam line, because without them, we would not have radiation experiments. Also the company that has uh, created our organoplate model and of course uh, funding by uh, local NASA Ames funding and the NASA Human Research Program. And I would also like to um, take a little bit of time to uh, introduce a course that we have developed this year. We are currently running the first cohort of participants. Um, but uh, we'll have another virtual course next year and we open it to international participation. Um, the course acronym is STAR, which stands for Spaceflight Technology Applications and Research. It is targeting principal investigators, postdocs and research scientists, so probably a little more senior people in the labs. And uh, we um, hope, well, right now we're teaching um, basically fundamentals of space biology, as well as um, the uh, practical implications of um, having a spaceflight experiment. And we have just recently opened the application to the next year's course with a deadline at the end of May. That's the website to um, uh, apply. And it will run virtually um, 
basically one seminar roughly every two weeks with uh, some extra seminars and meetings in between, between uh, September of this year and February of, ne of next year. And I am actually one of the organizers for this course and the point of contact for it. Um, by the way, that also gives you an um, email to contact me about everything, uh, any questions that you may have. And also, I, um, I understand that this is not a course for uh, early university students, but um, one of these years, um, there may be such course as well. So I would um, um, encourage you to um, uh, sort of keep in touch with the uh, NASA news to find out what, it, what may happen later. And I specifically wanted to uh, make sure I have a lot of time for questions. So I'd like to finish with a summary um, of my research. And I would uh, very much welcome any questions related to my research or in general to space biology or I suppose in general to me, if you have any. So uh, thank you very much again. Thank you so much, Agler, for this. Um let's say unusual presentation uh, and many a new topic to many of us and um, we do appreciate having time for questions so let's maybe give a floor to people who have this need to get an answer straight from Agla. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so I would like to know uh, when it comes for the the genomic and the immune responses, and also about the blood band barrier uh, thing. So when we use uh, the the drugs, for example, in terms of the drugs that we use here, and versus the uh, drugs that in terms that if we try to use in space, uh, what will be the uh, and maybe it's a name question. What will be the what are the uh, changes that we can observe uh, uh, here? Uh, uh, in the lab and as in, and in the space. Huh. Let me make sure I understand you correctly. Yeah. So would it be, what are the changes in uh, um, the responses to various drugs between Earth and space? Yes. That's right. That is a very interesting question and actually not very much studied. But we need to study it more for um, kind of two main reasons. One is, as I think what you are referring to, is that the human body changes in space, including if blood-brain barrier becomes open in space, more open than on Earth, then drugs that you take peripherally on Earth and do not expect them to get into the brain because it's normally closed, well, once you're in space, they will get into the brain. And they may have an effect there that you don't want. So that's one reason. Another reason is that uh, drugs themselves will react to changes in gravity, especially if they're liquid, like instead of, say, a, um, a tablet. Um, and they, will, they may react to our radiation as well. And then there are other issues like very, the atmosphere um, in spacecraft tends to be very dry. It tends to hide, that have high CO2. I have no idea if that can affect drug, but I think the best way to find out would be to study it. So it's actually a very good and very relevant question. There are ongoing studies. I just can't think of any um, that have been published sort of and completed that I could um, um, remember to cite right now. Okay, and maybe if uh, uh, others don't have, maybe could I ask one more question to you? Is it fine? Uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, I, I hope for a lot of other questions from other people too. That's why yes, I'm so here. That's the reason I just want to make sure. Uh, so, uh, in terms of the uh, research that you are performing, especially with the computer simulations, uh, other computer uh, studies, that so mm -hmm. I think uh, your lab, uh, as per NASA, is well equipped with those kind of a, a computational. Uh, setup and so on. So in terms of somebody who would like to kind of uh, uh, do some experiments like you or who wants to be who's, uh, like me, who is interested to do some computational work. So what are the uh, uh, things that I can, uh, I should actually prepare with in order to do those kind of an experiments, modeling experiments? 
Great question. And I will put some things in the chat. So the first thing I would recommend is go to Gene Lab, check out our massive space omics database. You can already go ahead and start analyzing and reanalyzing it and coming up with new ideas. We have done that. I got involved in some of the very first papers, and now there's many more, much smarter people than I am doing much more cooler research on it. Um, so that's the first start. Um, there's also an analysis working group which is a, combina um, a collection of scientists from all over the world who all um, use the same database to generate new ideas, to do reanalysis, uh, generate publications, and so on. So that's the very good first start. Um, the other possibility is, of course, if, um, and I think that's, that I have no idea what level you are, but it will be much more for, um, um, for postdocs is obviously applied to one of the postdoctoral programs. So I'm going to put a link to that too, because our lab right now has a postdoctoral position open, um, as in it has a solicitation, so we welcome applications. Uh, it is under the name of Sylvan Costas, the other PI in the lab, but uh, both of us um, uh, are instructors and our um, mentors of everyone in the lab equally anyway. So I will also give you an, um, a link to that. And I suppose you can probably share these links with YouTube later. So worth, um, worth checking it out, worth looking for, for positions and applying. Then there are also many internship positions, including some international internships, uh, specifically through um, uh, agreement with Lithuania, which I have no idea if that's relevant to you at all, but there are very different um, different agreements with different uh, places internationally. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Oh, question from YouTube. I'm going to read that and then somebody else can talk. Um, question from YouTube. Do you have any interest of applying laser induced breakdown spectroscopy in your field? And my answer here is, um, I have to admit, I have no idea what it is, and I would very much like to look it up and find out, and then I will be able to give you the answer. But uh, uh, thank you for this very interesting note. This is the, the drawback of being not a physicist, but a biologist who is now trying to learn everything about all these other fields that you need to know a lot about to be a space biologist. Huh? So do we have any more questions? I just got a question. Oh, I have got a lot of questions. Um, OK, I got two questions. Uh, which distant monitoring methods you are using? I am not sure I understand what is meant by distant monitoring here. Um, sort of what uh, what does it refer to to what we use in space flight because we use various um you know everything that we use in flight we measure the radiation we measure all the environmental factors right we need to find out what environment um, um our experiments are in so that's things like co2 temperature humidity radiation exposure notably um uh, so that's part of it. And then the other part is um, for each experiment, there are separate monitoring methods. So uh, sometimes astronauts are involved in uh, looking at the cells, even through a microscope. Sometimes, you know, if it's animals, it's going to be videos and videos are down -linked to Earth. And then um, researchers can look at their experiments, you know, running around in space, literally. Uh -huh. Question, question. Um, uh -huh. Do I have an idea what is the main reason why some humans are more resistant to radiation? Does it depend on the area where the human lived? Uh, that is a great question. And we looked at a few demographic um, differences already. Area we haven't looked in great detail, but so far haven't seen anything. That said, we don't have a very large uh, like difference between areas from which we collected samples. So that uh, that is an interesting hypothesis, especially because we know that the radiation uh, background on Earth actually is different between some areas. And some of them it can be um, significantly higher than in others. Not high enough for health damage, but still, it's interesting. Um, what is different is actually there's a difference um, 
based on age in the already baseline DNA damage. So radiation induces it, but natural aging induces it too. So um, older people have more DNA damage to begin with, um, which um, becomes interesting because then we start studying, okay, well, how does radiation interact with aging and can it exacerbate the natural processes of aging, which we don't know right now in astronauts because, well, they haven't been exposed to that much radiation as they would on a trip to Mars. But eventually we will have to uh, answer that question. Um, uh -huh. If different humans react differently to radiation, should we test the genes that are responsible to sensitivity to radiation and go with human genome engineering for spaceflight? This is a very interesting and futuristic idea. Um, more realistically in terms of application, we should test the genes that are responsible for sensitivity to radiation and then see if we can um, non-permanently target the mechanisms that uh, um, these genes, or rather, well, these genes encode through the proteins that they encode or proteins that they regulate. So that is a little bit more, um, I think, more likely because um, then whatever treatments um, could be uh, applied, they could be applied not permanently, they could be applied transiently, which is kind of what we need. Like we want to um, react to space flight stressors when we're in flight. It's a very specific set of conditions that need to be addressed right then and not like in general for the rest of somebody's life. Uh -huh. Any more questions, please? If we have none, I, I, I can shoot. So mm -hmm. uh, could you elaborate a little bit uh, about your lab on the chip? Uh, is, is it like how much were you involved in designing it, the system or, or how much you took it out of the shell from whatever company mm -hmm. gave you? Mm -hmm. That is a very good question because in general, lab on a chip for space flight is extremely relevant and interesting field of study. Our particular one is basically off the shelf in terms of actual plate. And then we worked on what to grow, how to grow it, how to make different, uh, um, you know, how to make the, the cells form a tube that then becomes leaking from in response to radiation, all of that. So the biological aspect, we worked on the biological aspect, but not on the engineering aspect. Uh, and we picked this one because it was um, fairly um, simple to use and yet allowed 3D high throughput studies and was fairly low um, footprint in a sense that it was like typical 96 well plate style, which is again, good for high throughput, good for future uh, flight applications. That said, for flight applications, we'll have to design it a lot better because everything that works in flight has to work on earth if you, if you, if you push it upside down. Because with microgravity, chips become very interesting and microfluidics become very interesting. So um, we have a very sort of some kind of ideas level beginning project with some engineers, which I am not. And that's why it's great to work in a team because we can find engineers and they can take care of things like fluidics while I take care of things like cells um, for flight adaptations. And there are some other chips that are custom designed for flight that are much, much, much lower throughput, but they have been flown already. Um, gut and kidney and um, um, actually some uh, neurovascular. The studies aren't out yet, but uh, that's something that's very, um, very promising as well. Combining the two would be ideal, of course, in future flights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Question from YouTube. If we're going to find out finally that the human body is entirely unsuitable for space travels far from Earth with existing protection technologies against radiation, what would be an alternative, maybe some radical solutions? Um, that's a great philosophical question. Um, 
And um, um, well, in terms of the practicality, again, uh, we're not going to find that out because we kind of already know uh, some hints at solutions and some hints at the kind of damage. And damage is there, but it's not that bad. That's the kind of idea. So um, it is unlikely that we will not be able to fly. Now, there may have to be some uh, personalizable solutions in terms of medicine. And also something that I didn't talk at all about um, at all is shielding. So um, there will be some shielding for astronauts both during flight and after landing. Now, galactic cosmic rays are notoriously hard to shield from, but what gets uh, what provides decent shielding is actually water. Uh, and that doesn't just mean, you know, a pool of water. It can also mean water in, um, um, in waste or water in food or water in a plant or something like that. So um, it is likely that any solutions um, for uh, longer duration space travel will, in addition to all my studies and all the idea about countermeasures, will also have to incorporate shielding. And I also haven't talked about, because I don't study it, um, sort of other types of countermeasures that are non-pharmaceutical. Like what kind of um, measures do we get from sport? What kind of measures can we, can we have nutritionally and so on? For example, for muscle and bone loss, the main countermeasure is not a medication. It's exercise two hours a day, every day, and that is good enough for preventing bone loss. So. Um, Things like that can also affect other systems to some degree, and it's always worth um, looking into. Uh -huh. Leading questions. When do I think uh, humans will be ready to stand on the Mars surface, and how far we are from safe travel? Should we go forward with unsafe travel? Um, my answer to that is we're going to be able to go forward with safe travel. We are. We just need to figure out how to make it work properly. And there's not very much point of trying to make a, send a mission that is unsafe, when a safe mission would maybe last, a, would maybe take a little longer, but otherwise would give us about as much trouble um, in terms of cost and, uh, and involvement. Um, so we will go with safe travel eventually. Uh, when will that eventually be? That's really hard to tell. But we are hoping lunar surface, well, we're hoping moon before the end of the decade. Mars in like another 10 years. That is not official NASA prediction. That's basically my best guess. But um, it would be nice for me to live to see that. Um, I obviously don't know, and nobody really knows. It's very hard to predict what happens to human spaceflight. But at least there's a lot of push right now going back to the moon, going onwards to Mars, it's very clearly a mission. So um, um, quite likely, you know, the kind of um, next 20 years becomes a reasonable prediction. But it will depend on a lot of things that happen on Earth too. So for example, COVID. So. Any other questions sort of last minute? Well, my, I know my time is pretty much almost up as well. Anyway, if you have any more questions or would like to contact me, my um, email is literally my first name, dot last name at nasa.gov. So it looks like our time, time is up. So thanks again, Agla. Um, I will once again give virtual applause for the audience. So um, have a good rest. And uh, for the rest of the listeners, the more talks are upcoming. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you for your great questions. See, I knew I would get questions, so I wanted to have enough time. And there we go. We are um, reaching the end of it. Thank you. Bye bye.